Hello, I'm Roger Congleton, uh, and this is uh, Econ 411 coming to you from West Virginia University. Uh, today, we're going to finish up our first block of material uh, on the transition from the late medieval period to the early Enlightenment. We're going to be talking about um, uh, four, four people, uh, uh, four scholars, four authors. Um, we're going to first start off talking about one more Dutchman, uh, Peter Lecourt. Uh, Le Court was um, uh, the son of, a, of, of an immigrant uh, to the Netherlands. Um, he, was, he grew up in a business family. Uh, he was trained at the University of Leiden. He was uh, a businessman, but also a person who in his spare time wrote about politics and economics. And many of his works were widely read at the time that he lived, um, which makes him relevant for our course. Uh, he's also relevant because he actually talks about ethics and economics together, uh, and whether they reinforce each other or conflict. And he, like Grotius, believes, uh, uh, in fact, stronger than Grotius, basically argues that markets tend to kind of reinforce ethical behavior. Uh, Baxter uh, is arguably the most important, uh, or at least the most influential of the figures that we're going to talk about today. Uh, he wrote um, a massive uh, directory of Christian life um, uh, which uh, characterized life for, uh, for Christians uh, in all kinds of dimensions, uh, you know, uh, just everything you could think of. Um, uh, he's important for this course because of his idea of the calling. Uh, so a calling is like a career that you have a divine duty to follow and do well, uh, and that those careers in his mind could be secular careers. They did not have to be religi religiously oriented careers. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, his, uh, uh, his arguments, uh, which again are faith-based, uh, uh, are very supportive of lives that are uh, heavily invested in commercial activities. In fact, he argues that you have a divine duty to, uh, to maximize your profits because the profits, the profitable opportunities in front of you were placed there on purpose by the divine being. Uh, Barclay is, in a sense, less important for this course, but in a way more important for Americans who are listening to this course. And that's because uh, 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 Barclay was involved in colonial America. Uh, he was governor of East New Jersey uh, uh, during the late 1600s. Uh, and uh, uh, Quaker ideas uh, heavily influenced the uh, developments in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, two quite important colonies in that period. Uh, and uh, they are the colonies in which uh, the most obvious kind of liberal uh, democratic arrangements were spelled out in, con in colonial documents, uh, including in, in Barclay's case, uh, freedom of religion. Uh, John Locke is, uh, uh, to present day scholars, the most famous of the group. Uh, his work in philosophy and political theory in particular are still studied today and thought to be kind of important takeoffs uh, for modern liberal thought. Uh, both uh, uh, what I think of as the right of center uh, part of uh, liberal thought, the, the free market limited government group, uh, but also the left of center liberals who believe in a more expanded role for government. Uh, so he's a pivotal, pivotal figure in, in, uh, in theories of, uh, of popular sovereignty uh, and uh, an important uh, uh, theorist in terms of his uh, defense of religious freedom, uh, support for education, uh, and also for his, his interest in ethics. Uh, in, ethical, in the ethical domain, uh, uh, he's the first among our readers to make a sharp break uh, between uh, religiously based uh, ethical ideas and you know, rules of conduct for life uh, and uh, more secular ideas about uh, appropriate rules for life. Uh, in that sense, he's, a, he's returning back towards uh, Aristotle's kind of reasoning, uh, what he calls civil, civil law or civic law. Uh, that is an entirely separate body of law of principles for behavior uh, than that which comes up from one's uh, religious readings and, and faith. Um, and so uh, he's the first uh, of this uh, post-1500 uh, scholars uh, to really start using kind of uh, secular arguments uh, for, for most of his uh, conclusions. 
Um, with that uh, introduction, uh, I'll move us to the, uh, to the slides. Um, again, you should be thinking about how different these perspectives on markets and, and life uh, in commerce uh, tend to be compared to those of Moore uh, and Thomas that we started this block of material with. Uh, they're really quite different, uh, both in terms of the kinds of arguments they make, but especially in terms of their conclusions about the, the, the tension between uh, commerce and ethics, uh, and therefore the role, the proper role that commerce should play in a good society and a good life. And so with that, I'll, I'll just move us over to the slides. So after the introduction, now we go through some of the meat and, and go back to some of the uh, language used by the scholars that we're reviewing today. Uh, I start today's lecture off with kind of a mid 16th uh, century or mid 1600s uh, painting. Uh, it's a painting that's so detailed it looks like a photograph to some extent. Uh, this is uh, one of the main squares in Amsterdam at this time. Uh, Amsterdam was not truly the capital uh, of the Netherlands, but it was its most prosperous city uh, and its largest city at this time, a city that had uh, really uh, flourished in the past 70 or 80 years uh, and become uh, a, a major center of trade uh, for Western Europe, but also internationally to some extent. Uh, you'll notice the great building at the, at the end. Uh, you'll notice a large cathedral in the background, which would have been there from uh, the period before uh, the, the Dutch Revolt. Uh, Catholic churches were uh, repurposed uh, as Protestant churches uh, in, uh, in the post uh, in the Republican period, uh, and uh, and so uh, Catholics would not be worshiping in that cathedral anymore. It would be uh, a place that Protestants would be using. Um, uh, Catholics were using secret churches. Uh, secret in quotes, uh, for their uh, uh, services, uh, just as Protestants had used uh, secret churches before the, uh, uh, the, the Dutch Revolt succeeded. If you look at the people in the picture, it's kind of interesting. They're all dressed uh, like we imagine pilgrims being dressed. Uh, we see uh, paintings of uh, pilgrims uh, around Thanksgiving. They're often wearing dark clothes with these white collars uh, and the the women all are dressed more or less like this. And there's a reason for that, and that is that half of the uh, people who immigrated uh, on the Mayflower uh, <clears throat> to found the uh, Plymouth colony in, uh, near, near uh, Boston, uh, uh, they were from Leiden. They had, uh, they had uh, spent uh, many years there uh, where they, they were freer to practice their faith than they would have been in England. Uh, they were English, English by birth for the most part, or at least uh, in families. Um, that were English in terms of their heritage, uh, but had moved to Leiden in order to have more religious freedom than they had back in England. Um, uh, and so they adopted some of the uh, customs, including some of the dress styles, I guess, uh, of, of people in, uh, uh, around them uh, in, in their new communities. Uh, it's quite a large square. In fact, if you went to uh, Amsterdam, you would, you would see that much of this is still there. Uh, one of the things that Europe uh, has done uh, uh, in general is that they have preserved the town centers of their old cities. Uh, so the cities are much bigger than they were at this time. Uh, you know, in, in this period, a large city you know, might have 50,000 people, might have 100,000 people in it, uh, whereas today these places would have uh, a million people or more in them. Uh, so they're much, much bigger places. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, they were not that much bigger than uh, Morgantown is when uh, all the students are in town and all the professors are here to uh, uh, provide lectures and so forth. Uh, these big open squares would have been used for as a market uh, uh, place, as a place to meet other people, to talk business and so forth. Uh, uh, and uh, this is uh, one of those uh, pleasant sunny days that you get in uh, the Netherlands once in a while, although it's a place that has really quite a lot of gray skies and rain. Uh, much like uh, Morgantown does. But this is the type of environment that, that uh, Lacourt is living in when he starts to, uh, uh, to write about politics and economics. Uh, he's writing, I think, from Leiden, at least that's where his family was based, uh, though he might have moved to Amsterdam uh, by this time, I'm not sure. 
uh, and it's not really important for what we need. Okay, what's uh, what's important is uh, you know his thoughts, his, his analysis, uh, more than his exact location. <clears throat> So Lacourt uh, uh, grew up, as I said, in a, in a business family. His, uh, his family ran a successful cloth manufacturing business, which was a major uh, uh, business uh, or manufacturing success in, in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, they were major exporters of cloth in this time. Um, he was educated at Leiden University, which now has a building named after him. In fact, I was uh, there on sabbatical uh, one year and uh, and, and my office was in Lacourt uh, uh, at Leiden University. Um, he was politically active in the Dutch, Dutch Republic for much of his adult life, writing books, pamphlets, and so forth in support of Republican forms of government, free trade, and religious tolerance. Um, we're going to focus on some quotes from uh, The Interests of Holland, which he wrote at just about the same time that painting was, uh, was, was done. Um, 1662, about a half century after Grotius' Mare Librium. Uh, was written. So, uh, um, uh, as should be obvious, but maybe would not be as obvious to people taking this course today, and also to some extent from the way philosophy and history tends to be taught, uh, this was a period of history that was extremely religious. Uh, religion was really the center of life for most people. Uh, not that uh, everybody was equally faithful, uh, but that um, you know the church was the hub around much of life uh, pivoted. Uh, commerce was um, important in the Netherlands uh, for many reasons. It was at the end of the Rhine River, a natural shipping port, a place to load things from uh, inside the center of Europe on bigger ships and uh, trade with other nations, other parts of of Europe uh, and, and, and at this point, even other parts of the world. Uh, so being a major port area uh, uh, on the Delta allowed uh, or at least helped uh, uh, the Netherlands to prosper. Uh, it also had certain other advantages. Uh, being on a Delta, it was fairly easy to dig canals uh, the ground in, in most uh, deltas is more or less rock-free and fairly uh, soft, and so fairly it's fairly easy to cut channels through it to to uh, tie all of, uh, or at least uh, most of western the western part of the Netherlands together through a, a network of canals, uh, <clears throat> which uh, uh, at that time uh, was by far the most efficient way of moving goods and services around uh, uh, in a region. So uh, the Netherlands was a highly decentralized uh, confederation at this time, and there was a lot of competition between the individual members of the confederation. So that tended to support free trade uh, inside uh, the Netherlands uh, more than probably would be natural in most uh, places uh, because of its decentralization. Um, so this first comment is, um, the court's <clears throat> conclusion about the nature of, of Dutch governance. Uh, God can give no greater temporal blessing to a country in our condition than to introduce and preserve a free commonwealth government. And so <clears throat> he's basically saying that uh, the Dutch government is in some sense blessed, uh, even though it's an outlier in Europe. Uh, most of Europe is still using the family-based governance that they've been using for almost a thousand years uh, with kings and barons and uh, Dukes and, uh, and and so forth. Uh, uh, and he also talks a little bit about some of the laws and, uh, uh, that were in place in the Netherlands that these tended to uh, provide uh, freedom of, of of occupation, freedom of gaining a livelihood. You could you could enter any business uh, without having to pay a special fee to the city that you lived in. Uh, you would not have to be a citizen. You just had to have a, 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 a location to fix a, a house uh, to have the common right of the other members of your community. Uh, so there weren't kind of special privileges for people who had lived in a community for a long time versus the new immigrants. Uh, such, such liberties, he argues, are very necessary for keeping the people we have and inviting strangers to come among us. So he's in favor of relatively open immigration uh, and support for people who had moved uh, into, into the Netherlands. 
The inhabitants under this free government hope by lawful means to acquire estates and use their wealth as they please without dreading that any indigent or wasteful prince or his courtiers or gentry who are generally as prodigal and uh, necess 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 I've never seen this word before, necessitous and covetous as himself uh, should on any pretense whatever seize the wealth of the subject. So uh, that sentence implies that property rights are pretty well in, uh, protected uh, inside the Netherlands and that there was no right of the noble families uh, and their uh, uh, upper staff uh, to uh, confiscate wealth uh, of people who lived in their territories. So that meant that they were, they were in a sense safe from predation, safe from being uh, uh, robbed essentially by their, uh, by their local nobles and, and aristocrats. Our inhabitants are therefore much inclined to subsist by the forenamed in other like ways or means and gain riches uh, for their posterity, their children, by frugality and good husbandry. So by good management and saving, uh, they were able to, and, and hard work, they were able to accumulate wealth and leave it to their, their children. This is certainly, uh, it is certainly known that this country cannot prosper, but by means of those that are most industrious and ingenious, and that such patents or grants monopolies and trade privileges do not produce the ableist merchants. So he, so one of the things that the Netherlands did in this period was to break with the uh, medieval economic organization called mercantilism, uh, where there were just all kinds of special privileges and monopoly grants uh, that prevented people from uh, entering in, uh, in, in uh, trades or industries or uh, engaging in certain kinds of market transactions. Uh, without special permits, without special grants, without these monopolies or trade privileges. Uh, and that allowed this more competitive market, this more productive uh, market to emerge uh, in the Netherlands and, 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 and in the Netherlands prospered and, and, and became uh, arguably the richest place on earth uh, for a good hundred years, uh, beginning roughly in this period. Uh, it is certainly known that this country cannot prosper. But, uh, moreover, it is apparent that he who increases his estate by industrious and frugal living is most burdened uh, by wealth taxes, and that he that by laziness and prodigality, which is you know, spending more than you should, diminishes his estate, will be less taxed. So that virtue is unjustly oppressed and vice favored. Whereas on the contrary, the imposts on consumption fall heavily on the riotous and 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 uh, and indulge and encourage the virtuous. So uh, in this, uh, these excerpts, I haven't uh, focused on his exact uh, the list of virtues, but you can see that basically he's arguing that uh, industriousness, hard work, uh, you know, useful work, uh, profitable work, these are good things, and that saving uh, and good management are virtues. Uh, and that the government should support these virtues. Um, and this is, again, uh, an echoing Aristotle's idea uh, that a good government uh, encourages the, the, the development of virtue uh, in its citizens. Uh, but notice that these are virtues, uh, um, industriousness and frugality, are virtues that uh, are not on Aristotle's list. Okay, there's there's nothing on his list that that, that, that points in this direction. Uh, in fact, the frugality of people in this period might have been regarded by uh, Aristotle as a uh, as a vice, as a, as being under liberal in their use of wealth. Uh, and uh, and so there's a shift there in favor of savings uh, in 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 uh, between Aristotle and this period. Uh, but of course, a lot had happened in between, so I don't want to argue that we just shifted suddenly from an Arist Aristotelian point of view or, or society to something else. I mean, this is really a bigger shift uh, away from Moore and Erasmus than it is a, a shift away from Aristotle. So, uh, to shift forward a little bit, uh, now we're going to change, uh, go across the Ch English Channel to England. Uh, uh, and we're going to uh, uh, take a look at two uh, English theologians 
who occasionally wrote about secular matters. So uh, I've given you a short introduction of both of these fellows um, uh, in the introductory remarks, and I won't repeat them. So uh, as I said in the introduction, uh, Baxter's idea of a calling uh, is an important one. Uh, uh, and he places it on, religious, uh, on a religious uh, footing. But it doesn't have to be religious to be a calling. That is, there are people who have careers that they really devote themselves to uh, uh, as if they have a divine duty to uh, engage in those activities. And it, it doesn't really matter in terms of their behavior and whether they do so because of Baxter's theory or just because in some sense they've internalized a sense of duty to that particular uh, career. Um, and and uh, this idea of a, of a duty to your work uh, is partly implicit in Aristotle again, uh, but uh, this is a special kind of uh, uh, duty. It's a kind of devotion to your work uh, that uh, Baxter argues uh, may have divine origins. The first and principal thing to be in, uh, intended in the choice of a trade or calling for yourselves or children is the service of God and the public good. And therefore, other things being equal, ceteris paribus, a term widely used by economists, but not widely seen in much, uh, much other literature, uh, that, that calling which most conduceth, conduceth uh, to the public good is to be preferred. The callings most useful to the public good are the magistrates, you know, government officials, the pastors, uh, you know, ministers, and so on, uh, priests, uh, and the teachers of the church. Right? So he starts off uh, with kind of the high officials and, uh, and emphasizes uh, uh, jobs within the church, uh, but then goes on to schoolmasters, physicians, lawyers, uh, farmers, uh, and then uh, people who are involved in shipping, who make clothing, who sell books, uh, make clothing, and so forth. Um, so if you think about this list, it's not, it is somewhat different from Aristotle's list of careers, right? So it includes uh, religious occupations that Aristotle doesn't mention. It includes kind of government officials that Aristotle doesn't mention. Uh, but after that, the list is not so different. Uh, Aristotle has a special place in his heart for schoolmasters like himself. Uh, uh, later in, in the ethics, something I didn't emphasize when we went through it, uh, he argues that uh, the best life, the most satisfactory life, is, is his own life, the life of a scholar. Um, but he, he also places farmers, uh, husbandmen, uh, uh, above most other careers, much, most other secular careers, uh, and, uh, and then talks about harvesting things from the earth directly. Uh, uh, and then uh, and then after that, he has uh, uh, people involved in commerce per se, like a seller, a tailor, and so forth. Most of these careers are production, productive careers. They produce the tangible things uh, with their hands and skills. Um, uh, and, um, and then he goes on to say, and such others that are employed about things most necessary to mankind. So anything that kind of has a significant, contrib significant contribution to mankind's uh, existence, which, uh, if interpreted kind of broadly, would include almost every other career, because you wouldn't be paid to do something unless someone thought it was important uh, that a, a certain job or service be provided. If God shows you a way in which you may lawfully get more than in another way without wrong to your soul or any other, if you refuse this and choose the less gainful way, you cross one of the ends of your, of your, your uh, calling. That is, you've, you've uh, uh, crossed off one of the ends of your calling. Uh, and you refuse to be God's steward and accept his gifts and use them for him when he requires it. You may labor to be rich for God, but not for flesh and sin. So... <clears throat> Uh, this is a, uh, a different way of thinking about the accumulation of wealth. You may have a divine duty to accumulate wealth, uh, take advantage of all the opportunities that come your way, uh, because those are under Protestant doctrine uh, intended. You know, those are part of predestination, part of your predetermined life, if you want. If you want. And if you refuse and choose the less gainful way, you cross one of the ends off your calling, and you refuse to be God's steward. Uh, 
You may labor to be rich for God, though not for the flesh and sin. Well, that, that implies that you accumulate wealth not for your happiness um, or, and not just to accumulate it uh, you know, as kind of a status game among other uh, relatively wealthy people. Uh, but you do so because it's uh, it's your duty to do so, uh, uh, your divine duty to do so. This is this is quite a strong su uh, support in a theological so based society. Uh, you know, it's it's as strong a support as you can imagine. And as I said, his his work was in print for um, uh, about three hundred years. Um, so it was it was read for years and years, and and many of these ideas. Uh, are emphasized in Weber's, Max Weber's uh, analysis of the uh, spirit of capitalism uh, done in the early 1900s, so almost 300 years later. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Barclay. I won't spend as much time on Barclay as I did on uh, LeCourt and Baxter. Uh, I think Barclay is uh, an influential figure, but probably not quite as important as those other two, because Quakerism is not um, um, you know, it was an important religion, religion in this time, and for the American colonies, it was quite important. Um, but it's not a dominant religion anymore, and it really never was. Um, it, interesting, mostly because of ideas that uh, its members uh, had about the proper way to live, um, uh, that influenced public policies in, in the United States, or what became the United States. So one uh, interesting thing about Barclay is he refers to the Netherlands uh, as being blessed. Uh, you see this, uh, this high regard for the Netherlands among many British scholars uh, and, uh, and, 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 and evidently also British theologians. God, God hath often a regard to magistrates and their state, uh, the government officials and their, and, and their governments, as a thing most acceptable to him. But if any can further doubt of this thing, to wit, if without confusion it can be practiced in the commonwealth, meaning commerce and trade, let him consider the state of the United Netherlands, and he shall see the good effect of it. For there, because of the great number of merchants, more than in any other place, there is the most frequent occasion for this thing, honesty and promise keeping. Uh, through, uh, and though the number of those that are of this mind may be, um, uh, be considerable, to whom the Dutch states these hundreds hundred years have condescended and yet daily condescend yet nevertheless there is nothing of prejudice followed thereon to the commonwealth government or good order but rather great advantage to trade and so to the commonwealth so this is a fairly tangled sentence and we can't blame this on the uh, on the translators because I believe this is written in English uh, most uh, authors in this uh, this period in England were writing in England they, in English they had switched away from Latin some years ago a century ago um, so what he I think is arguing is that uh, the uh, aristocracy of the Netherlands uh, although they were did not run things uh, in the Netherlands as they did elsewhere uh, at least not totally um, uh, they kind of looked down on merchants uh, and so they yet daily condescend and yet the merchants uh, are responsible uh, both for ethical conduct honesty and promise keeping uh, and also um, to the prosperity to the great advantage of trade and the wealth of the commonwealth uh, which you know made it a much more attractive place to live uh, and of course allowed it to attract productive immigrants from throughout europe um, like the Lacourt family uh, that made contributions to uh, uh, to uh, uh, the Netherlands uh, right from the beginning. So I should say before I move on to Locke that uh, Baxter and Barclay both had rather severe ideas about what uh, a good life sh should should uh, involved it, it had virtually no leisure uh, it was entirely devoted to uh, religious matters uh, although in their view uh, trade and commerce could be uh, understood as a religious matter a calling um, and so it was not um, a life of a monastery necessarily 
but with you know, but with whatever wealth you managed to accumulate, um, you, you had a duty to put it to good use uh, for the community uh, rather than spend it on frivolous things for yourself. Uh, and in fact, I believe both men uh, were opposed to games, dancing, singing, uh, uh, and things of that sort, things that people actually do for fun, uh, except uh, singing, of course, and, and, and religious uh, ceremonies, uh, although even that was uh, not always allowed in Protestant uh, 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 religious groups. So at this point, uh, we're going to move on and uh, start focusing, and you'll see this is, this is true uh, historically in terms of scholarship, uh, that uh, the next group of scholars that we focus on are not a-religious, they're not atheists, uh, but they are people for the most part, who might be regarded as deists. And deists have this quite different view of, the, uh, of the, the manner in which the divine being kind of operates. Basically, they believe that the divine being kind of put the universe in motion uh, and, and did so in a way that was deterministic, that, that the universe is going to unfold in a particular way because there were underlying principles that determined all the relationships between things in the universe, and that those principles um, could be uh, learned one way or another uh, by uh, observation, experiment, uh, uh, rational analysis of, of, of the things you observe uh, and those experiments, and of arguments of possible expl explanations for those phenomena. Uh, and that, that methodology would allow you to discern these underlying natural laws. These are divine laws. And so it's another way of thinking about uh, the purpose of philosophy or natural philosophy as uh, gaining a deeper understanding of, of divine intent on the planet. Although it's, uh, it's, a, it's a methodology that doesn't place a lot of emphasis on, uh, on texts that are regarded to be divine by most uh, believers in, in, in the various faiths around the world. Uh, and I think you could put Locke into this group, um, um, although he, you know, grew up in, in England and, and spent some time in the Netherlands uh, 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 in the period actually right uh, before he started publishing all his work. Uh, he's um, uh, he's a person who uses uh, secular reasoning uh, far more than kind of connections back to religious documents. And in that, his uh, approach is uh, quite similar to Aristotle's. Uh, uh, and sometimes this period from block forward uh, to about 1900 or 1800, say, is, is called the... Uh, the period of rationality. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a period where uh, uh, many scholars and, and others who uh, were emphasizing the use of reason to understand nature. And, and, and that generated a great acceleration in scientific knowledge. So it was quite productive uh, and turned out to be quite useful as well. So at this point, uh, and this is true right through until about 1900, most everything that we think of as science today was a sub-area of philosophy called natural philosophy. Uh, and so when you see people use the word philosophy, uh, it, it often is a synonym for science in this period. Uh, on the other hand, you don't see the word science very often uh, before uh, this period. And Locke is the first person in our group uh, of scholars uh, that uses the term science. Uh, in this case, science is trying to understand something about uh, rules of conduct. And there are a couple of ways to do this. One is you can just look and, see, and try to understand the basic uh, logic of rules of conduct. Right? So you could have an explanation for uh, an overarching explanation for why these rules make uh, are part of one logical way of approaching life, uh, as uh, to some extent Aristotle did. Um, or you could just study the way people in, conduct themselves uh, and, and appraise their behavior as ethical or not and try to understand 
the reasons behind that, uh, sort of a social science or sociology of ethics. Um, and what uh, Locke does is kind of halfway between these two things. Okay, uh, so he 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 has a theory of science, which is the uh, science en encompasses everything that humans can potentially understand. Right, so there are things that are, are beyond human understanding, and those are not science. Um, and so he has an area of uh, reserved for uh, faith, if you want, or for other phenomena that are just simply beyond the scope of human uh, intelligence. Uh, some of those phenomena might simply lack a pattern, might just be random phenomena uh, that, um, that can't be easily explained. Um, uh, we have the term chaos and chaos theory for those uh, areas of knowledge uh, these days. Uh, for the purposes of this chapter, um, um, uh, it's important. This, this idea of science is important because he regards ethics as a science. So science may be divided into three sorts, uh, all, that, all that can fall within the compass of human understanding by being either first the nature of things as they are in themselves, their relations and relationships, uh, their manner of operation, or secondly, that which man himself ought to do as a rational and voluntary agent for the attainment of any end, especially happiness, or thirdly, the ways and means whereby the knowledge of both the one and the other of these is attained and communicated. So the nature of the world, uh, uh, how uh, people should behave in that world, and third, how you learn about both the nature of the world and uh, how one should be behave. With regard to the second, which he regards the, as the practical area um, of knowledge, the skill of right applying our own power and actions for the attainment of things good and useful. So notice that that area, the second area, includes what we would call technology. That is, the world has certain features, and some of those features can be changed through human actions. Um, you know, using technologies of one kind or another, devices of one kind or of another, or theories of one kind or another. So, uh, um, so farming allows us to uh, encourage certain plants to uh, to grow and uh, and, it, it, uh, and so there are proper ways to farm right that are relying on natural principles in part one okay but they're using those relationships in a special way in order to attain good things edible foods and so forth for our own sustenance uh, it also includes ethics which is uh, which uh, methods uh, uh, are in a way most appropriate for a good life, uh, which ways to measure and assess human conduct. And these are not entirely practical of that technological variety. The most considerable under this head is ethics, which is the seeking out of those rules and measures of human actions which lead to happiness uh, the means to, and the means to practice them. So notice he's back to Aristotle, leads to happiness. Remember, Aristotle thought that happiness was the uh, fundamental goal of hum human action. And we haven't seen that in the previous works, right? The previous works have all been kind of grounded in uh, religious ideas, uh, yeah, even Grotius uh, uh, believed that uh, the rules that people had in the back of their minds were planted there by the divine being. In this case, uh, uh, the aim is inside individuals rather than something outside them. Uh, is, is the aim is happiness. Uh, the end of this is not bare speculation and the knowledge of the truth, but right and a conduct suitable uh, to it. Uh, and he goes back, if you remember, Aristotle mentioned that uh, uh, moral principles and the laws uh, uh, have to apply to so many choice settings that it's virtually impossible for their rules to be perfect that there will always be a little bit of imprecision in the, in the guidance provided by those rules. Uh, so that you'll have to be adjusting things at the margin 
uh, a bit, uh, especially in odd or extreme circumstances. Uh, and uh, you'll see Locke uh, reaches the same conclusion, possibly drawing on readings of Aristotle since he had a lot of time to, to study and was a, an educated man. Another thing that makes the greater difficulty in ethics is that moral ideas are commonly more complex than those of the figures ordinarily considered in mathematics, from whence these two inconveniences follow. First, that their names, or if you want categories, are of more uncertain uh, signification, the precise collection of simple ideas they stand for not being so easily agreed upon. And so the sign that is uh, used for them in communications, or the word, I suppose, uh, always and in thinking often does not steadily carry with it the same idea. And so the same a single uh, word or concept uh, might be used in somewhat different ways and actually can have different meanings uh, when used in those different ways, unlike um, you know, the expressions in mathematics. He also goes on to argue um, in a manner that's similar but not the same as Aristotle because it's not stressed in Aristotle's uh, work that uh, uh, moral uh, uh, abilities, uh, uh, being a moral person, uh, tends to be a product of education uh, rather than sort of part of the individual's uh, uh, genetic or uh, natural makeup. Examples of truly self-made men are but few, and I think it, I may say that of all the men we meet with, nine parts of ten are what they are, good or evil, useful or not, by their education. So uh, Locke is also a proponent of uh, public education, uh, something that was quite rare in, these, in this period. Uh, also, uh, it, 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 it did exist, though. It's not that it, was, it, was, it didn't exist at all in, in, in the colonies or in England or in the Netherlands at this time. Uh, but it was still uh, not, not so common. And then he goes on to separate out laws of conduct into three categories, um, and I guess uh, one of which is grounded in religious thought. Uh, the second, uh, things that emerge in a society through uh, as formal law or, or, or just norms of behavior that aren't grounded in theology. And then there are other laws of fashion or private censure, uh, which men variously compare uh, their actions to. Um, so whether you have good tastes in wine or buy the right stereo or cell phone, uh, you know, these would be laws of fashion. Uh, the law of public societies would be, uh, you know, traffic laws, uh, conventions to pass, uh, to drive on the right or the left side of the road, whichever you know, one happened to emerge in your particular society. And the first would be principles of conduct that have religious foundations. Um, for, for the purposes of this course, it's the first and second, I suppose, that uh, constitute the domain of ethics. Uh, I think most laws of fashion are rules that people follow. I think uh, Locke is completely correct on that, uh, but they are generally not regarded to have anything to do with moral conduct. Uh, and it's by their conformity to one of these laws that they take their measure uh, when they would judge of their moral rectitude and to denominate their actions good or bad. Morality is the relation of voluntary actions to these rules. So morality and Locke's terms uh, is, is kind of the internalization of these rules and whether you're, you act in accordance with these rules routinely or not. Uh, the more routinely you do so, the more, more uh, uh, moral uh, are your actions. So he has a theory of the emergence of government, uh, which I think um, uh, is, is a reasonable model uh, mostly for uh, some of the town governments of the English colonies and possibly other colonies around the world, where groups of people joined together, uh, formed a community, adopted their own uh, laws and regulations, uh, and they did so in order to increase their safety, uh, reduce uh, crime, make their claims on property more secure, and things of that sort. 
So a commonwealth is a, is a government that's devoted to the welfare of its uh, citizens as opposed to um, an extractive regime by a king or, uh, uh, or a nobleman who, uh, uh, who govern more or less so that they can maximize their own um, happiness. Uh, and without paying a lot of attention, uh, except as necessary, to that of their, their citizens. So civil interests I call life, liberty, health, and an indolency of body, or you know, sort of leisure, uh, and the possession of outward things. So you'll notice that Locke does not have industry in his list. Right? Uh, he has the opposite, he has leisure. Um, in possession of outward things such as money, lands, houses, furniture, and the like. So the accumulation of wealth is one of the uh, civil interests that people uh, have. And it's advancing those interests that causes people to group together and form governments, in, in his view. The duty of a civil magistrate, government official, uh, uh, is through the impartial execution of equal laws to secure unto all people in general and to every one of his subjects in particular the just position of those things belonging to his life. So those just things are in this list, you know, liberty, health, leisure, and possession of, of goods and services and wealth. Uh, so uh, uh, the purpose of government is protect these uh, uh, so not to enslave people, steal their leisure, okay? uh, not to harm people and ruin their health, not to imprison people and uh, eliminate their liberty, uh, and not to interfere with their accumulation or use of, of, of their wealth. So uh, the connection between ethics and wealth is indirect in the way uh, Locke talks about them, but it's clear that, right, that that's one of the reasons that governments are formed. And in some other parts of his work, he actually emphasizes it and places that as a, a central reason rather than just one of many. So Locke concludes, um, here it is, and thus the commonwealth comes, to, uh, comes by a power to set down what punishment shall belong uh, to the several transgressions which they think worthy of it. So once you form this government, uh, they're going to publish, you know, punish people for violating uh, what came to be called rights uh, to liberty, health, uh, um, uh, and uh, your property. Uh, so uh, in order to protect these uh, rights, uh, the Commonwealth would punish people who violate those rights uh, or violate the rights of others. Um, so, so they write down the punishment committed uh, among the members of that society, uh, as well as it has the power to punish any injury done to any of its members by one that's not of it. So it would, it would undertake to enforce these or protect these rights both uh, uh, among within the community, you know, as with criminal law, uh, and attacks on the community by people outside the community, by as as we say, terrorists or invasion, uh, uh, war, and that sort of thing. And all of this is for the pr preservation of, pros of, pro of the property of all the members of that society, as far as that's possible. So that last line is is one that seems to really emphasize the accumulation of wealth um, as a really central purpose of life. Uh, and it's so important that the job of government is to protect uh, that property. So there's much more to Locke and much more to the other authors than what I've uh, summarized here. Uh, again, my aim in going through these authors is both to kind of show how ideas about ethics change through time, but also how implications of those ideas uh, vary through time uh, with respect to commerce the accumulation of wealth uh, and uh, and market activities generally. Uh, so uh, all these people are theists. They all believe in a divine being. Uh, so in that sense, there are common elements among all the authors who wrote after 1600. Uh, they all argue that at least a subset of the grounding principles of their theories are divine, have kind of religious origins. Uh, all reach similar conclusions about the nature of the good life and good society, at least insofar as economic activities are concerned. 
uh, nonetheless, the particular conclusions reached and the arguments used to reach them vary uh, among all the individuals. And this is partly because, you know, they're taking place in different minds, but also they're taking place in different periods and they have different and different societies. And so the, the kind of ideas that they're picking up in their society uh, differ from one another. Uh, and as, as, as intelligent persons, they're, uh, the, the use made of those ideas varies from individual to individual. So for the purpose of this book, we're kind of arguing that these uh, these free ideas and their communities are most important because they're the data used uh, uh, in developing their theories. Uh, and they're also used when they uh, try to create uh, illustrative uh, um, examples uh, to support their theories. And so in some sense, it's, it's, uh, it's that data that's more important for the purposes of this course than are the uh, the theories themselves, but the theories are still interesting um, uh, and important because they're showing you how uh, uh, individuals are, are are changing and with respect to the way they think about the universe and think of their think of their place in it, uh, both of which influence conclusions about ethics and and commerce. So in 1500, the good life was one in which trade, commerce was minimized and leisure was maximized. The, the, the life of nobles or uh, old money, as we would put it today. Uh, by 1600, this had changed, at least in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, Brodius develops a theory of natural law and uses it to defend free trade. Uh, Lacourt points out that prosperity is generated by industriousness and trade, uh, which are a blessing rather than a, a um, some kind of divine punishment, uh, but that that, uh, that 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 prosperity could be threatened by poor government, poor governance. Um, uh, that economic freedom and prosperity were blessings, not distractions from a good life. Um, Baxter argues that ordinary jobs can can be a calling, part of one's divine duties, uh, as can be the maximization of profits uh, accumulated through honest. Uh, conduct, I suppose. Uh, Barclay suggests that a proper life is one of industry, uh, but that the wealth accumulated should be used to advance religious and public interest. Uh, an idea still uh, uh, common today. Um, uh, I should mention that in, in the uh, uh, Puritan colonies in the United States, uh, it was actually uh, illegal to to, to engage in leisure in many of them. And, and the people who were found engaging in leisure uh, were punished, uh, not severely, they weren't hung or anything, uh, but they might be locked in stocked, stocks and made fun of, uh, uh, other than respected. Uh, Locke suggests that governments, the purpose of governments, when they emerge from agreement rather than conquest, are largely founded, uh, are, are, are largely, um, um, created uh, to, cre uh, to protect one's liberty and property. Uh, and thus implicitly, he's, he's arguing that the accumulation of wealth and property are important uh, to uh, individual life, important to happiness in, in his, uh, in, in his uh, uh, characterization of what the aim of life is. Uh, and thus has to be protected as one of many things that contribute to happiness. So overall, you could say that the um, uh, the shift in sentiment among these scholars from 1500 to 1700, roughly 200 years, was a gradual uh, shift in emphasis away from uh, religious matters and towards matters on earth. Uh, that made the accumulation of wealth, industriousness, and frugality uh, uh, into, into virtues rather than corrupting temptations when undertaken uh, honestly and the wealth accumulated was used properly. Uh, and we're going to see that these trends continue in the next century 
uh, and, and the century beyond, uh, and that uh, if anything, the support becomes uh, more secular uh, and uh, more sophisticated and more complete uh, in that next 200 years, and that that uh, shift in, in norms is highly correlated with the uh, acceleration of commerce uh, in that period, what I call the Great Acceleration. Uh, and uh, that uh, this book, as indicated in parts one and, uh, one and two of the book and parts two and three of this course, uh, suggests that that, that that is causal, that that phenomenon is causal, that shifts of ethics that tended to cause, and, and other norms that tended to cause people to become more supportive of commerce uh, and, and include, give uh, commerce a more central role, both in a good life and a good society, uh, tended to cause uh, economic development to, the, to accelerate. And so we'll continue with that uh, next time as we move on to the third block of material.